Romans chapter 11, verse 33 to 36, it says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgment and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been His counselor or who has given, him, uh, given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Father, indeed, just like what this verse says, you are just above everything. You're a cut above the rest. And Lord, to you indeed is the glory and the majesty and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship you. Majestic Creator, you're perfect in every way. The Alpha and Omega, how awesome are your ways? We bow down. We cry out, life giver, redeemer, amazing is your grace, full of wonder is your power. We bow down and we cry out. Let's sing it out. We enter in your gates. Let every voice proclaim. Be enthroned in this place. You are worthy. Oh, heaven shouts your name, creation sings your praise, great is the King of kings, you are holy. You're holy, yeah. life giver, redeemer. Amazing is your grace, full of wonder is your power, even angels can contain, so we bow down, yeah. we cry out. We enter in your gates, let every voice proclaim, be enthroned in this place, you are worthy, all oh, heaven shouts your name, creation sings your praise, great is the King of kings, you are holy, we enter in your gates. Let every voice proclaim, be enthroned in this place. You are worthy, all oh, heaven shouts your name. Creation sings your praise, great is the King of kings. You are holy, 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 holy.
water in your gates. Let every voice proclaim, be enthroned in this place. You are worthy. Creation sings your praise. Great is the King of Kings. You are holy. We enter in your gates. Be enthroned in this place. You are worthy. All heaven shouts your name. Creation sings your praise. Great is the King of Kings. You are holy. You're holy. You're holy, Jesus. You're holy. Lord, we are again uh, declaring that you are holy, that you are a cut above the rest. There's just no one like you. And today, as we look into your word, may again, may we see again that the kind of God you are, that there is no one and nothing like you in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A pleasant day to everyone. Again, we are still going through Psalms, and today we're going to go through a, uh, Psalm 73. And this Psalm was written by uh, a man named Asaph or Asaph. Um, he's believed to be a, a man who was a Levite and a contemporary of David. Uh, both of them uh, are referred to as uh, skilled songwriters, poets, and uh, musicians. And so here we have one of his psalms, and let me read it to you. We will be reading verses 1 to 3, 13 to 17, and verses 23 to 26. It says here in verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. In verse 13, then he says, All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all, day, all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then this, I discerned their end. Verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will receive me to glory. Whom ha have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now, there's not much that we know about Asaph, but I believe he has spoken in the psalm something that many of us our, our feelings, many of us are going through. And so, it is my prayer that as we simply go through these verses, we will gain insight on how we should um, respond when there seems to be doubt, uh, there seems to be things that are, uh, what we're seeing and what we believe about God does not coincide. That there, when there seems to be injustice. And I believe that's what Asaph was talking about in, the, in these verses. That although he declared in verse 1, truly God is good to Israel. So that word truly God is good is a confession of how sure Asaph is about how go the goodness of God. That 
God is indeed good. And to, although in the next verse, uh, in the next line, he says this, to those who are pure in heart. Now, of course, because he's a Le Levite, I believe he was always in the temple court, in the sanctuary. He's, he always sees people giving their sacrifices. And he was referring to that, to be pure in heart, that, that God is good to the pure in heart, to those who come to him uh, day after day. You know, when I read this the first time, I said, wow, truly God is good, but he's only, he's only good to the pure in heart. Paano na ako? You know, with all of the impurities that I have in, in, in me. And the good thing is that although in the Old Testament, they would go before God with sacrifices, they would go to the priests so that they would be purified. And again, being pure in heart does not mean you never have impurities. It only means that you are in the midst of your impurities, you are purified. And in their case back then, it was the priest who does that, going to the temple, having yourself purified. But today, I'm so glad that as we look at the finished work of Christ, although we are so unworthy to receive the goodness of God, that truly that we have a God who is good, in His goodness, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ. And because of that, we who are full of impurities in our heart, are made pure before Him. And thereby, we are able to receive His goodness. And, but in the midst of this confession about the goodness of God, Asaph saw something that caused him to almost let go of his relationship with God. In verse 2, it's, he says, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my step had nearly slipped. You know, in other versions, this said that he almost lost his foothold. This is a picture, when you, whenever we talk about foothold, and even here, the picture of this is someone climbing up a mountain, or if you're uh, someone who goes to uh, a recreation, uh, a recreation place where in there's this uh, a mountain climbing uh, a wall, uh, that wall has foothold called, uh, the, the thing where you put your hands and feet on are called footholds. And when, when you, are, you slip from that foothold, when you, it will cause you to fall. So he was saying here that he was about to fall away from his faith. He's about to let go of his relationship with God. Even though he knew God is good, even, you know, even though in the first verse there was a confession of the goodness of God, he said it, this, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. And in the next verse, he gives us the reason. He says this, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And I don't know about you, but when I read this, I could so relate. Na minsan, you know, you, you, you know God is good, but so many evil are around us. So magtataka ka, you'd, you'd have this I know, doubts about God's goodness. In fact, verses 4 about verse 12 talks about um, Asaph's uh, what the, the injustices he saw that there was something that he saw that did not correspond to the goodness of God and that's why he was about to say I'm about to let go I'm, all of that I'm seeing I'm about to turn away I'm about to slip I'm about to fall away but you know throughout this psalm after um, he said all of this the same this same psalm gives us asaph's antidote to what he saw to the seeming injustice to the to the inconsistency seemingly of a world where a good god reigns and this is what he says the first antidote of 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 asaph to what he saw to his to his um anguish and to his um, situation where he's about to fall he said this F first thing that we that's good about Asaph is this in verse 3 the very same verse where he said he was about to fall because of the prosperity of the wicked there's a key word there that helps us understand that it was not the wickedness or the injustice that was causing him to fall away it was what Re let's read it again for I was envious it was envy. 
You know what envy means? He was about to let go because of his envy, and then he, he enumerates all of the injustice. But if you understand the word envy, what, you really, what he really means is, I'm not angry because of the injustice. I'm angry because the arrogant gets to get away with it. And envy means, I wish I was in their place. Meaning, if you think about it, Asaph understood that there's something in his heart that is really rotten to the core. That he first came before God and said, you know, I have to admit, all of this that I'm seeing, it's not because there's injustice in itself. And I know some of us may be angry about injustice, and it caused us to, be, to, be, to fight. But here we see, just like Asaph, maybe we should also look into our hearts first before we take, before we take a stand and think we're righteous. Because in because of the, our, the impurities of our heart. You know, there are times that even when we do the right things, we do it with the wrong reasons and the wrong motives, especially when it comes to our heart. It's so deceitful. But here Asaph saw it and he said, for I was envious. And it teaches us that although we see all of these bad things, although we see all of this injustice, maybe it would be good for us to have a heart check. Why am I getting angry? And for some of you, you might be angry for the right reason, but it's always good to check our hearts and see where is my heart at in the midst of my anger, in the midst of my frustration with what's happening around me. And that's what's so good about verse 3. He said, I was, for, I was envious. He understood. He saw what was in his heart. And it would be good for us to ask God even to look at our hearts and to see what's happening in us. Not just what's happening around us. You know, bilis pansinin what's happening around us. But it's always good, always good to ask God and really see what's happening in us. Kasi mas importante yung nangyayari sa loob natin kesa yung nangyayari sa paligid natin. And then, the second thing he does after understanding that it was envy that's causing him to fall away and to, to be, to, to, when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. The next thing he says, he, he does really, is this. In verse 16, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a weary task. So he tried to understand all of these, but it was a wearisome task until, verse 17, I went into the sanctuary of God then I discerned their end. So the, the, the next thing he did, aside from understanding what's happening in him, is that he did not just stay outside and looked at what, hap- what was happening around him. As a Levite, he said this, until I went into the sanctuary of God. One of the antidotes for envy and even doubts and the anguish in our hearts. Here he he says, until I entered the sanctuary, means worship. He worshiped God. And I believe as a worshiper himself, that helped him to focus not on the things around him, but in the God who is truly good. It helped him to look at the goodness of God. It helped him to understand that for those that he loves, he would take care of them. And the goodness of God also says this, for, that for those who are evil, there will be judgment. Verse seven, uh, chapter 7, 3 outlines that God will judge even the arrogant and the evil. Because the goodness of God does not mean He'll just do good things to those He loves. The goodness of God, even for us, we judge something as good, if they, some, something or someone as good, if they do something about evil. Yung galit nga natin minsan sa gobyerno, if they do not do something against evil, we call them evil as well. Because they're not doing something against, against evil. Because goodness, really if you talk about goodness, someone who claims to be good or is said to be good must do something about evil. And when Asaph went into, Asaph went into the sanctuary, he began to worship, he began to look at the God who is good, who is able to... Uh, to do good to his people, to those who are pure in heart, 
and to, is able to also bring judgment. In fact, he says this, that until I, I saw, uh, he said this, then I discerned their end. That in the end, God will right every wrong. If not in this life, in the next. That's what he saw in the sanctuary. So when we're in doubt, first of all, we must see what's inside. That's what, when we're in doubt of God's goodness, first we look inside and, say, and, and really lay it bare before God. Second, we go to his sanctuary and worship him, lift him up, just like what we're doing now. We're lifting him up. We're, we're worshiping him. And then, as we come to an end, he says this, and he gives this confession. With, with all of the doubts around him, as he goes to the sanctuary, he says in verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. Wow, such a confession. After him going to the sanctuary and seeing the goodness of God, one thing he affirmed is this. Not that he was holding on to God, but he realized it was God continually holding on to him. That in all of the evil we see around us, in all of the injustices and in all of the doubts we have, take heart. It says here, as Asaph confessed, you hold my right hand. God continues to hold us. And my prayer is that even as we look to Him now, we are, we are made aware that we have a God who holds on to us. Even though at times we're about to let go. He, was about, he said, I was about to slip. He realized one of the reasons he did not completely step is because of a God who holds on to him. And that's the same for us. And then he continues to say, you guide me with your counsel. Wow, you guide me with your counsel and afterward you will see me to your glory. That word counsel means this, uh, his word. Um, you are guided by his word. But that word counsel has a nuance. The word counsel comes from the word counsel which means to summon many. Which means this, we have to get a hold of God's word in any way we can, in any source we can. Even when you say counsel, when summoning others, meaning the different writings back then, the different authors of the word of God, it was talking about the, the whole scripture. And aside from that, counsel can also mean in the community of believers where God will use people to speak to you his word. That's why... When you, go, when you go and say, I'm going to ask counsel, what you really mean is, you're not just going to one person to ask for advice. You're going to many people. Because counsel means that exactly. And it says here, you will guide me with your counsel. That God continues to guide us in the whole counsel of his word. That, that's why we should not let that go. And also in the community of believers that he has uh, he has put placed us in and in verse 25 and 26 this is a very popular verse for many of us it says here whom I have I in heaven but you then he confesses you know uh, here on earth there's just so much wickedness but I look to you whom have I in heaven but you and there's nothing on earth the thing that he desired and envied for and he was envying he said, there's nothing on earth I desire. desire. When he saw God, when he saw the goodness of God, when he was in the sanctuary, when he realized God was holding him, he said, there's nothing on earth I desire but you. Such an antidote for envy. And then it says in verse 26, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of what? My heart. He says God is good to the pure in heart and sometimes our hearts may fail. Who is our strength? God is the strength of our heart. God is the one who strengthens us. God is the one who assures us. When He sent His Son, for us New Testament believers, when He sent His Son, He assures us. He is the strength of our hearts. He upholds us even in our feelings. And then it says here, this last phrase, and my portion forever. You know what portion means? Um, I, you know, when you have a pie and you slice it and each one gets his portion, a portion is what's rightfully yours. That's what you call a portion. You have a portion. And many of us, we look at the world and we think we deserve a portion from the world. 
And that's why when something is taken away from us, when someone has more portion than us, envy comes upon us. But you know what the psalmist, what Asaph says here? Lord, the world may take my portion. Everything may be taken away from me. I may not have what my neighbor has. I may not have what he has. But you are my portion forever. That for us who are believers, who are worshipers of God, followers of God, He is our portion forever. Kahit ano yung meron yung mundo, si God, siya ang portion natin. He is our portion forever. And that's why it eliminated the envy in His heart. And this is my prayer for all of us that in the midst of what's happening around us, may this psalm speak to us Strengthen our heart and assure us that we have a God who is our portion forever. Let us pray. Father, thank you again for the assurance. Thank you for your word that is upon us. Thank you for this psalm that teaches us how to face uh, life when, when there seems to be doubts and injustice and, and wickedness around us. Lord, help us continually to hold on to, um, to you. To Thank you, Lord, that even as we look at this psalm, you assure us God, that you are the strength of our heart. You hold us uh, with your right hand and that you are our portion forever. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship God. again Romans chapter 11 verse 33 to 36 oh the depths of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. God bless you.